Now, with the with the olive pythons, um, I'm going to start with with weight, uh, with with breeding. We're, we're talking about breeding olives, and to me, it was more about the weight than the age. Uh, a lot of the books I read when I first got into breeding the olives, uh, the books were saying four four and a half years of age. What is more true is four and a half kilos of weight than four and a half years of age. If you can get them to uh, your female to four, four and a half kilos at two and a half years, three and a half years, you know, you should be, you should be sweet. Uh, youngest I've ever gone is two and a half years where I've successfully bred. Um, and I think I've got a clutch of 11, maybe 12 by, by memory. Um, but yeah, and that girl was a touch over, a touch over four kilos. So, so to me, breeding olives for your girl, first time round, four, four and a half, four, uh, maybe five kilo tops, that's about it. You don't, don't want them much heavier for their first time round. Males, uh, like, like you with your carpets, males, I like them more, uh, leaner, lighter. Um, I found bigger males were, were lazy, they'd sit in the corner. You throw a young lean male in, he's, he's going to chase that female down. Um, now, Tree had a question about a male. Um, punch it up again, Tree, if you don't mind. I think it was about a, a male. What's the oldest girl? Oh, if you bred. Uh, I think Tree's question was about a, a lazy uh, male, low libido male. Um, uh, I'm thinking. If I'm wrong, uh, correct me. But um, for the for the low libido males. Um, again, if it if it's not a weight thing, if he's nice and lean, if you are lucky enough to have a second male, whether it's a wild type, a het, an albino, uh, uh, whatever it is, you know, um, we're, we're just talking olives in general. If your male's lazy, and some males can be, some al uh, albino males, you know, more so can be. Um, if it's not a weight thing, uh, then then it's a lazy thing, so um, stir, him, stir him up with, uh, with another male. If you, if you can combat him, sweet, combat him, throw, throw another male in and let him fight it out for a couple of minutes. Stay on hand, stay, stay handy, um, but... Maybe uh, have another person? Yeah, maybe have another person because these are, these are big snakes. Um, but in combating, they very rarely bite. It's usually a, a, a weight pin trying to pin you down they, they very rarely bite in the in the combating mm. um so try that if you haven't got another male try a um uh skin uh just the male of another skin did that no skin the skin of another, of another male, male. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> throw that in um that might be enough to, to trigger him off um but yeah the um combatant combatant works with the males Failing all that, try resetting him. Take him out, um, take him out, leave him away from her, uh, her away from him, leave it like that, leave him separated for a week, uh, 10 days, after 10 days, bring him back to her. Always him to her, never her to him. Um, females stay in their own cage, he always goes to her. Uh, I've seen a question before about what is the oldest olive of bread? Um, I think the oldest female I've bred from would have been about nine, ten, but I, I think Scott Iper got one out of an old girl that was about 20 odd. Uh, don't, don't quote me on that. That's, uh, I'm going back from, you know, a, a, a drunken party telling stories years ago with Scott, so <laughs> um, don't, don't quote me on it, but yeah, I'm pretty sure Scott Iper got a a really old girl to go once, like a 20 year old girl. Um, and Peter Birch, I'm, I'm not sure if he's still watching. Um, he's got an old old girl down there and I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure if he's if he's managed to breed her with a bit of age. Um, average clutch size of a healthy female. I've found average clutch size to be around the 16, uh, 14 to 16 mark. Uh, the biggest clutch I've had though, I think it was a clutch of uh, 20, 24, uh, 24, 26. The biggest clutch I've ever heard of was Peter Krauss 
with a clutch of 31. Wow. Um, yeah. That's a big clutch. So that's the, that's the biggest clutch I've ever heard of. Hit about it's 27, 27 year old and still dropping, I think that said it went, went by pretty quick. Uh, viable logs. Yeah, thanks, Peter. So there you go, 27 years old. This is from Peter Birch. 27 year old female, still dropping viable eggs. So there you, there you go. Um, Tony Hall, where did the granite come from um, with the olives? Uh, that's uh, Gavin Bedford. That popped up in his collection. Uh, I remember seeing that, the first one. Oh, geez, eight years ago or something. Um, down at uh, there's an expo down south. First time I seen that, and um, I, I he's uh, and can you? I'll have to. I'm missing some of these men. Um, uh, now yeah, that's that first come about about eight eight years ago, maybe longer. I, I can't remember. Um, clutch of thirty six olives over here in Perth this year. Clutch of thirty six. Well done, Richard. So anyway, back to the back to the granites. Um, I remember that too, Richard. So that's a new record, man. Um, back to the granites. Uh, uh, Gavin did produce a few more. Now, what's actually happened with that project? I'm not sure. He 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 did sell a few off, I think. And uh, I think Marty Bahaja might have might have got some. I'm, I don't don't quote me on it. Um, I'm not sure if if a couple other people got a pair or two. But um, where they're at with the granites, I, I don't know. But that's, um, yeah, as far as I know, that's where they stem from. They, they stem back to uh, uh, Gavin Bedford. Sam, uh, Sam Dutton wants to know if you can put a 10 kilo boy with a 6 kilo female. Yeah. Yeah, of course, can. Yeah. Whether he's going to do anything, I don't know. Uh, my tip is, is he's going to sit in the corner and, and do nothing. Um, my males, um, my heaviest male, uh, probably would have been about five and a half kilos at about 10 years of age, something like that, I suppose. I, as in, I, I kept my males lean. Um, and I, I think that was a trick with, uh, with the males. Now the olives, the olives can get, <coughs> excuse me, the olives can get to be a heavy snake. If you want to pump the food into them, and make it 20 kilo plus snake, you, you can do that, but I don't know how good that snake's gonna go for breeding for you. I remember uh, uh, Kel Worley, um, he he had a huge pair once, I think one was 15 kilo, one was like 17 kilo, and he got a clutch of one. You know, bigger the snake doesn't mean bigger the clutch. Um, so where, I think the same year he got that on a, a girl that was four and a half kilos and it was her first time around and she spat out 12. Uh, second year around she, uh, she went, she was about five kilos, uh, she spat out 16. So yeah, the bigger the snake doesn't mean the bigger the clutch. Uh, Just to go back to the granite thing, yep. um, Steve Crawford, Steve see, Crawford. The, see the one he's got? No. It just changed and it's Looks like an hour, nearly an hour, you know. No, I'll, no I'm crazy. out of the loop with I'm out of the loop with that one. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, Deb just reminded me of it. Yeah, no, well, I'm out of the loop with that one. So again, the granite I was talking about was uh, uh, the ones that uh, Bedford was was playing with. Uh, as for Steve Crawford's line, um, God knows. Well, we were only talking about him last week with his. Yeah. What were they? Children spotted those, those pie ball things. Um. Yeah. Those things. So it yeah. seems like Steve's got some good, good critters. He always. <laughs> this, this, is stuff. Stuff. this is just an only that just changed. Like you know, how you see the granity looking things. Yeah. It yeah. Sort of looked like that, but then it just went white, like a creamy white. Like in calico black and thing, you reckon they yeah, could be like a liver like, or a it's sort of or? like that. But um, I'm not sure if it's exactly like that with the cancer and stuff. But. All right. Well, any more? Um, Very interesting. Animal. Hey, Kane, we're talking about you before, brother. Um, love seeing you on YouTube this week on, on Criticam. Mm. <coughs> so, um, good advice. Uh, for those that didn't see Criticam, Kane told all you, driving along the road, see a turtle, slow down, don't, you know, and swerve, don't, don't. 
All right, run the pool buggers down. Mm. Um, if you can do us a favour, I'll keep, I'll keep jamming through some of these notes that I got. Any questions that, that come through, are you right to, to read them out? Yeah, I'm still looking for them. Yeah, yeah, jamming then. Um, so now, with with the females, we're talking about weight. Now, with, with uh, weight, so I'd feed hard, um, like December, January, February, March, and, and I'd feed hard twice a week. Um, excuse me, three to three to four medium racks per time. Medium racks being 150 to 170 grams. Um, three to four, um, you know, at the beginning of the week. Three to four at the end of the week. That was with the females. Males, I'd, I'd maintain them on like one or one or two racks. Um, now. When I that would be January, February, March. Come um, what have we got here? Come April, uh, come April, May, and June. That's when I'd be backing down the the nighttime temps. And um, when I'd be backing down the nighttime temps, I'd also back down the the feeding. As you're dropping off the heat, they um, you know they can't digest as as much food. So you're dropping off the heat. You have to drop off uh, some of your feeding. So during um, January, February, March, uh, feed feed hard. April, start backing your temps down, your nighttime temps. Sorry, your night your nighttime temp, um, and, and start backing your feedback again. Uh, back it back in May, and again June. You want it backed all the way back. Um, so when you hit June, you um, you know, what have we got here? I don't want to skip a step, so you know, I've got when you're reducing the nighttime heat, I used to reduce it one hour per week. So normal time of the year, this time of year being March, um, my nighttime heat used to cut off at eleven at night. So eleven PM it'd shut off, one AM it'd kick back in. So that's that's how it was set up. Um, and then in April I'd start knocking it back. So April, I'd reduce it from 11 o'clock. Um, the heat would shut off at 10.30 at night and then it wouldn't kick in until 1.30 the, ne uh, the next morning. And then the following uh, week, I'd reduce it another hour again, but half hour per side. So it had, the nighttime heat would shut off at 10 o'clock at night and the heat wouldn't kick in till two o'clock in the morning. Now I kept doing that all the way down um, until I had my lights shutting off at six at night and kicking back in at five, five in the morning. Now the reason I had them kicking in at five in the morning instead of six was it was a big room, uh, big enclosures, uh, a lot of space that, that needed heating up and I needed that extra hour to, to get the extra heat. Each room's different. Each um, each each room set up different. Each cage is set up different. So you got to tweak your room to to how it's set up. But that's that's yeah a rough guideline for you. Um, now the main thing I found, as long as you gave them the um, the variance in in heat of fifteen to eighteen <laughs> degrees, and I found as long as you got a difference of 15 to 18 degrees between your nighttime temp and your daytime temp yeah you're in the you're in the right sort of ballpark area so what I'm trying to get across there is nighttime temps I used to like getting my nighttime temps down to like 13 to 15 uh, 13 to 15 degrees daytime temps I'd like to get them up to 32 to 35 degrees. Was that a big question that, that just come through? Uh, just then. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, is that? Dad wants to keep her mum happy and get the paradox out there, you know, yeah. <laughs> and then the other real question is from Tony Paul, and he's just saying, uh, no, where is it going? He was asking about. Double heads or something? Alright, oh, I think he might have been talking about double heads with the granites and elves. Oh, uh, okay. Um, so again, I, I don't know much about that project. I'll try and find some more out about it and I'll do this again when I can overthrow some uh, overlay photos as well to help you out. Uh, I had a bunch of photos lined up for this, so I spent hours lined up a bunch of photos. 
And yeah, anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I used to like having a, a heat a, a heat difference of 13 to 15 degrees between what, what I got my cages down to at the night time and what I got them up to during the day. And if you can get that, that heat variation, yeah, you, you should do well. Um, while you're bringing down your heat, yeah, I mentioned that, while you're bringing down the, the heat, it, um, you need to bring down how much you're feeding. Uh, you don't want to keep feeding them a heat if you're only giving them a little bit of food, uh, uh, a little bit of heat, sorry, food's going to go rotten in their guts and, and you're going to end up in, in trouble. Um, so you want to, a little tip is, is you want to make sure you're happy with your weights around March. Um, so, so like I said, come March, uh, January, February, March, that's when, you're, that's when you're pumping the feed in. March is, is your last real month. So to me, a little tip, I'd weigh my snakes in January and see, see how they're tracking from, from January. And that gives you a couple of months. And then at the beginning of March, you've got a month then, you know, right, I need to jam a heap of rats into this one, or this girl's looking good, I can, I can start warning her back a bit. So um, weighing your snakes in January and then again in March is a, um, is a good little tip. Stop feeding. Um, I used to stop feeding first of June. I'd want the females out of that food mode altogether. I've, I've seen it happen where you throw the male in with the female, female still in a food response mode, and she'll grab that male and, uh, and she'll bite him and she'll wrap him up. I've seen, I've, I've seen it personally where a female's grabbed a male by the head and wrapped him up and tried to kill him. Dave Palumbo, Palumbo, something like that, uh, from Muscle Serpent University over, over stateside. I think he had a female kill one of his males. Now that was, uh, he, he lost a um, L male or a het male. He, anyway, he lost, a, he lost something decent. 22 to 18 Broncos. Uh, <laughs> yeah. to go. Come on, rabbit eyes. Daniel Bradley <laughs> wants to know um, uh, how, cold, how, how cold would your room get? Yeah, 12 to uh, 13, 13 to 15 degrees. It, it never really dropped below 12 degrees um, of, of a night time. Um, now, of, of the daytime, uh, again, 30, 32 to 34 in the, uh, or 32 to 35, sorry, in the, in the hot end. Um, cold end, they, they used to get down to 28. So our, our enclosures were six foot long. Um, so yeah, the hot end would get 32 to 35. Cool end would be down to uh, 28. And we had a heat divider about a third of the way through to keep that hot end re really hot. Uh, we also had our vents in the in the front of the enclosure instead of the back, and we had sliding glass front, so uh, plenty of airflow at, at the front there. So you got a really good heat gradient the whole way the whole way through the cage. Um, I'm gonna have to get this snake out. Just, just behind you <laughs> to keep the mother-in-law happy. Yep. All right. So now I'd introduce the males um, in, in um, June, but it'd be like the second or third week of, of June, all depending on the female. I'd read the female. If she's still pacing that cage and she's still looking like she's wanting to feed, um, I wouldn't throw the male in. It'd be, she'd be sitting there nice, um, nice, cool, calm, um, sitting near the cool end, cooling herself, just, yeah, calm, placid. You can see she's not going to tear the head off of the poor boy. That's when you introduce your male. So you don't want to stop feeding and introduce your male. You know, tomorrow there's a good chance that your male is going to get messed up. Um, so another another tip is uh, for the first night or two, keep keep a good eye on them. If um, if your female is is still yeah, in, in food mode, uh, she could just trigger and and bam, uh, just just whack him for no reason at all. So um, it does pay to set set an alarm, 
You know, if you got work the next day, set an alarm, get up every couple of hours, go down, double check, just yeah, be on the on the safe side. Um, after the now after your first night or two of observation, this is key, key part. Leave the buggers alone. Do not touch them. Don't feed them. Don't clean them. Don't look at them. Leave them alone. I seriously used to water mine every Friday. That was it. As soon as that male went in with the female, uh, I left them alone. If um, yeah, if they don't uh, if they don't uh, uh, if they defecated in the cage, I'd, I'd spot clean that. I wouldn't do a full clean out. I'd do a spot clean. But you know, if they if they pissed in the corner, it stayed in the corner. Um, it, it, uh, I did not interrupt them. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, he's happy now. <laughs> that's it. So to me, that's key. Putting your putting your male in with your female, and after a couple of nights of observation, leave the leave the buggers alone. Don't uh, don't don't interfere with them. Um, what have we got? Don't clean. Come now, come August. Another little trick with um, so you've you've pumped your females up the size. They're looking good. You've paired your males. We're in August now, and you should be seeing ovulation. If you're not seeing ovulation, a little trick you can do, and be very careful with this trick. I don't don't want newbies trying it. Um, with your hot end, spike your hot end up to like 38 degrees and and leave it up there for like two weeks, two weeks, three weeks. Um, I found if I had a female and she hadn't ovulated, if I spiked that, that hot end up to the 38 degrees, um, maybe even 40, 42 sometimes, that would be enough to, to trigger her and she would, she would ovulate. You'd see the ovulation within about two to three weeks. Um, now, after after ovulation and and pre lay shed, that's when that's when I'd remove that's when I'd remove the, the males. Um, now I'd also start to increase the night temps in August. So this was another thing that used to help trigger the, the ovulation was um, increasing the, the nighttime temps. So you know how we reversed it back by an hour. We're just doing it in reverse. We're warming them up by an hour. Everything going to plan. You should have eggs out in. Uh, you should have eggs in September. Um. So, what do we got? What do we got? Oh yeah. Uh, again, this is my notes where I had heaps of photos to put up for you guys. Um. Is this one week? Sorry, is this one? one week in one week with the male. Oh, one week in, uh, one week out yeah. with my No, no. Um, I used to, with mine, I had, um, I'd run one male over multiple females. So my male would only spend one, two nights tops in with any female, and then he was moved on to the next um, with a Saturday off or a Sunday off. So I'd give him one night a week off um, where, where he could miss the females. But um, other than that, I used to run, uh, yeah, run like one male over, over three, different, three different females. So that's one thing you can do. Um, how long after adding the male uh, would you spike the tip for ovulation? If not, so it looks at August. If you haven't seen ovulation by, say, um, end of the first week, second week in August, I'd spike the temp um, in, in August and I'd leave it spiked for a, um, for, for a couple of weeks, probably till the end of August. Um, now I'd also start, you're also increasing your night time temps as well. So you've got two things there. Um, how many females per male? Record I've done is four. Gavin Bedford done one male over five, but he didn't get five full fertile clutches. He, he mm. got slugged out on a couple. So I, I'm going to Gav, I got four <laughs> with fertile clutches. Yeah. So another way from Gav, uh, I wish I'd have got the five 
but four was was my best. Um, so yeah, August. If you can spike them in, spike them in August. So you should see um, you should see ovulation. If you don't see ovulation by the end of August, I, I, I'd say yeah, yeah, you're pretty well done. Um, yeah, yeah, not gonna see it. You'll be lucky if you do. Um, you might in September if it's late, if you're having a late one. But and again, this is different different states and and whatnot. I'm southeast Queensland. Um, but yeah, eggs for me, eggs were in September. Um, now I wouldn't start feeding my females again um, until October. Once I knew all the egg laying was was finished, um, all all the girls were done, uh, everything was done. That's when I'd start feeding, and I'd start feeding lightly. And I say start feeding lightly because the the girls it, it takes a lot out of them, and they look absolutely horrible. You want to get condition back on them really quick. But if you bam a whole heap of weight into them, you're going to kill them. Um, so slow, slow and steady during October um, and, and November. Slow and steady food items. Now with, with slow and steady, I'd start them off with, with like a 100 gram rat, small rat. Um, 90 gram, 100 gram. That'd be my first one back after they'd laid. So they'd laid a clutch of eggs. Um, everyone's finished. No one else is laying eggs. Uh, so a week later... All the, all the girls will get a small rat each. A small rat each. The next week they might get two, uh, one on the Monday, one on the Friday, or one on the Tuesday, one on the Thursday, and then I'll slowly up the size of the rat and how many until I hit December, where I'm just mainlining rats again, um, getting them ready for for the next season. If you didn't get eggs and you've got a whole heap of condition on your females, you don't want to be mainlining rats in September. You want to be feeding lots of small rats because um, you want to keep the metabolism high and you want to strip some of that fat off the girls. You want new fat on them before breeding season, not old old fat from last year. So, yeah, if you don't get the eggs out, um, if you don't get the eggs, yeah, careful with, with how much you're feeding. Um, I meant to... Um, yell out yeah. to Gary Robinson before because he's not, he was watching. Mm-hmm. But, um, hey Gary. Um, what have we got? Started uh, feeding them. Yep, December. December starts smashing the food back into them. Now incubating. I used to incubate the eggs at 32 to 32 and a half degrees. You hear you hear stories or you heard stories about albinos need to be incubated lower um, you know because they'll come out blind and they'll come out this and they'll come out that I incubated lower and I've got a heap of problems a heap of kinks missing eyes um, now I don't think the missing eyes was from the temp but I'm, I'm pretty sure the kinks were um, the hatches were small they were, they were fiddly they were a pain in the ass to get feeding I uh, spoke with Peter Birch Peter Birch told me he'd done a trial run with some Elbane Teresia. He, he upped them to 32, 32 and a half, and he got out bigger, stronger, healthier, healthier hatchies. Mm. So I tried that with the Elb Olives, upped them to 32, 32 and a half, and sure enough, strong, healthy um, hatchlings. No, no kinks, um, it, it was perfect. They, they fed really well, very robust out of the egg. They were, so yeah, um, don't, don't incubate. If you do it, if you go on the albs, and you've heard you have to incubate lower uh, on the lower side for, for albinos, uh, I call bullshit. I say go high. I go 32, 32 and a half. Uh, did you get clutches every year from the same females? Oh. Uh, yes and no. I, I, best I could do was two years running. So uh, uh, most of my girls. Would go two years on, then they'd have a year off. Two years on, a year off, and and they just stayed like that, and they have stayed like that since I've uh, sold them too. So the girls that were due for a break had a break. The girls that had a break that were due to breed, breed. 
So um, even though they're in a in a different collection and and different setup, all that sort of stuff, they still stay yeah. true to form. Yeah. So that oh they yeah. They need a break. They, they have a break. It, eh? So that's yeah. There you go, Daniel. That's what I found, man. Every every second year, um, mine mine had a break. Um, and again, average clutch size for me, um, breeding them like that was around the sixteen as well the, the 16 clutch size um uh now incubating them at the 32 to 32 and a half um i'd cut the eggs at day 77 I'd, I'd never wait for them to pip i'd always cut and i'd cut early last thing you want is hatchlings drown mm. you cut yeah i cut early all the time do you all yeah the time. i think it's a good habit to be yeah. in so um i've got here Again, it's, it's been three or four years since I've bred them, but by memory, it was day 77, I used to cut, look, and assess. So if if the hatchies were still right down in the bottom of the egg and belly up, uh, yeah, they still got like a week to go before um, before they're due to pit. If they're right at the top of the egg, um, they're the right way up, they're ready to go, slash the, slash the lot, cut them open. Um, don't, don't, you know, you see Jay Brill getting in there with the finger and ripping them out and yeah. stuff, don't, don't do that. Just, um, just, yeah, cut a nice big slit in there for them to get out so, so they won't drown. Um, sorry, yeah. I missed something there on off. All I've got to off. Oh. Uh, Broncos, Broncos for the win. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, cheers, Brett. Jeez, man, you crushed me, bro. <laughs> Go and cry myself to sleep. <laughs> um, what's uh with the uh, cutting? With the break, break two years. No carpet, no. No, they can go a lot. Longer. Yeah, yeah, carpets on it. Yeah. It is a good. It is a. It is a good practice to just let them get. Have a year off every three years or so, but it's not necessary. <laughs> but I, I, I do it. Yeah. All right. So if everything's going right, you've got your eggs, you've incubated them at thirty-two to thirty-two and a half. Uh, Seventy-seven days later, you've you, you're going to cut them open. Now, if you're doing everything right, believe it or not, uh, like nine times out of ten, that. Day 77 was Christmas Day. I um, I was always cutting all of eggs on Christmas. And one of the best Christmases I had was I had four four olives go one year. Might have been five, I can't remember. But I had them all go. They all ovulated in the same week, all laid in the same week. And I cut them all open Christmas Day. Amazing Christmas. Um, Joey has to watch today if you've ever had a... Male attack of female. No. No, it's always been female uh, attack of male. I've, I've never had a uh, male attack the female during breeding season, but when I was a kid and I first got into olives and I was broke as buggery, I, I was keeping two olives in the same cage uh, and they were, yeah, they were seven, six, seven foot olives, decent, decent size olives. Um, and they were both they, they were both kept in a six foot enclosure um, uh, all, all year round. I didn't have the money for for a single enclosure. I used to separate them to feed them. One would stay in the in the enclosure. The second one would go into a polystyrene box. Um, I'd feed them. I'd feed them like that. I'd leave them separated for about an hour, hour and a half, and then I'd put them back together. Now I do remember once I put them back together. The male went straight up to the female. I put because I always used to take the male out. The female always stayed in the cage, um, and so the male was the one that come out. I put the female. I put the male back in. He went straight up to the. Um, he went straight up to the female. Straight up to the belly where the rat was. Give it a good hard sniff. Whack. Bitter <laughs> rafter, and they were into it. They, they were fighting. It was everywhere. Uh, what sucked was the cage was at head height, 
Oh, I'm in there at head height, yeah, trying to get these snakes wow. out. Snakes are coming out this way at me. Oh. Jess is, oh, Jess is, Jess was only young at the time, my wife now. Uh, she was only young at the time. A little bit laughy because it was like, yeah, interesting and funny, but a little bit panicky because <laughs> like, shit, what's happening? He's, he's you know, in with some big snakes here. Wow. Um, so that, what I ended up doing there to, um, to separate them was oh, I ended up grabbing the pair of them and they, they grabbed me, they didn't bite, but they, they had me wrapped up. All three of us went for a hot shower. Now that wasn't boiling hot water, that was just you know, hot water, um, you know, like, like you would a shower, the snakes find it uncomfortable, they, the male let the female go, and here he goes, jumps, jumps out of the shower. So um, that's, that's how I separated them. Uh, hey, Troy, Bromie. Troy Bromie, how you doing, brother? Uh, what else we got? Um, so yeah, everything going right. You'll um, you'll have some you'll have some little hatchies for for Christmas, and and I hope you do. There's there's nothing better than baby olives for Christmas. They feel you've you've bred olives before or no? Um, have you had the place yet? No, not yet. The fe- not well, yet. you would have felt them over at my place. That that velvety yeah feel um, that they get. As yeah, hatchies. Yeah, they we only had one. One clutch and that was egg down. Right. Yeah. Yeah, those um, I got here things, uh, some things that can go wrong, and this is where I had a heap of photos. I actually had a photo, uh, uh, some really good photos of a uh, olive, it was an alb olive, and she was egg bound. Now, your average size olive egg is about you know, 90 grams, 100 grams. This girl, she she was olive bound. Now, there, there are two things you can do. You leave it for a couple of weeks and see what happens. And the egg's either gonna shrivel up and die and come out as a shriveled up dead egg, which which I've seen happen. Um, or you can, if you are worried after a couple of weeks, uh, I'm sorry, after a couple of weeks and nothing's happened, you, you know, take it to the vet. Something, something, needs, to, something needs to happen. And um, and it's up to you as to how, how quick you, you want to get involved. Now, Dan and I have removed eggs ourselves. Um, and again, I'll cover that in another one. Uh, there's another question for you there in a minute, brother. Um, I'll cover that in another one where Dan and I have actually removed eggs ourselves. And, and I've got photos to, to show you all that. But again, that'll be when I work out how to do this system, but with this girl I'm talking about at the moment, she was legit stuck. The, the egg, you know, it wasn't at the vent where Den and I got involved. There were four eggs stuck at the vent. This girl, uh, she had two eggs stuck right up high. Um, and that was, that was a, a trip to the vet. So up here, we're lucky. We got Josh Linus up here, Dr. Josh. Um, so I went on, went down to give Dr. Josh a call, let him know what was going on. Uh, went down to Dr. Josh and he removed these eggs. Near the two that were egg bound. Remember me saying the average size egg for an olive is 90 to 100 grams? These two eggs come out and 190 grams each. Wow. Double the size. They were massive. No this, this girl was not going to pass them. Um, so sometimes... Yeah, there's nothing you can do. You just yeah. have to get the vets, uh, uh, the vets in, involved. That question was about um, Merton's water monitors. Can you have a couple in the same enclosure? Yes, you can. Is the easy answer. Yeah, there we go. Uh, now, he still wants to know: Have you had a male attack? Oh yeah, we've answered that one. Um, yeah, things going wrong, so the eggs going stuck. Um, uh, what else? What else? What else? Yeah, back in the day with the albinos, um, you used to see a few albinos getting around with um, legit no eyes, and it, it's a shame I don't have the photos to, to back it up because I, I had one for several years. Is one of the best pets I had. Was was this no-eyed 
I love Python. Is that the one we had for a while? I think so, yeah. yeah I got, that was right, I couldn't get the bag of feeding. No eyes, and I'd put my hand there and I didn't know it's my, no, my hands there, you know? Yeah, like, that, that's right. I remember yeah. sitting at home, Deb had a bit more time on her hands, Deb got it up and going. Yeah. And um, and yeah, ended up being an, an amazing animal. Yeah. And yeah, 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 no eyes, but, but still. So I, I got uh, a photo for that again once. Um, I might throw that up tomorrow, actually. It's, a, it's an interesting photo. Um, the other one was a really good photo of Wayne getting absolutely nailed <laughs> <laughs> by one of my olives <laughs> on the arm. Cheeky so, <laughs> um, that was good. Um, uh, now, another thing with, uh, with uh, albinos is uh, the colour. The, um, the albino olives, they actually come out. Oh, and you had the brain hemorrhaging one. Oh, yes, I did too, the one with the blood. Yeah. That we had to keep releasing the blood out of. That was yeah. really interesting. Yeah, so what that one was, was we, we had this one hatch out, and after a week, its head just swelled up. Um, didn't have a clue what it was. Took it to Dr. Josh. Um, I can't remember what it was. It was some sort of aneurysm or something called it. He, he re, you know, released the pressure and drained a heap of uh, blood away. Brought it home a week later. Up, up it swelled again. And, um, and yeah, that thing, I can't remember if that thing died or not. I, I really can't no, remember. I'm sure. Um, I don't know if you remember. Yeah, Deb. She's got the hemorrhage photos. There you go. She's got some hemorrhage photos that she'll send through. So, again, I'll be throwing some photos up tonight and tomorrow of, of some stuff we're talking about. Um, and I'll do another talk again when, when I'm at home and I don't have Wayne to bounce off of and I know what I'm doing with the program and I can get that stuff up. Stuff up. But, uh, yeah, um, colours, the, the albino olives, they come out. Uh, they come out very yellow. It isn't until they, they get older that they become that white. So you see people, I've heard people saying that, you know, they're breeding high white ones, other people saying that they're breeding high yellow ones. Don't, don't get caught up in any of that sort of bullshit. Okay. It's um, because they, that's exactly what it is. It's all bullshit. Yeah. They, they come out uh, a really nice yellow and as they age, that yellow fades out to, to a, yeah, a nice white colour. Um, so they, those are the, that's, that's how the colouring, um, that's how the colouring works. Um, so now that's about, I didn't have enough blood to keep doing it. So it had to be, there you go, yeah. Um, that, that olive that we were just talking about, um, it, it wasn't producing enough blood. Um, it, it, it swell up, but it, the rest of the body, you know, was just dying. You'd see it, it was starving and, and stuff. So yeah, that thing got euthanized. Um, so, but that's um, that's that's it for that little spiel. Went for about half hour. So sorry if that went too long, guys. But um, yeah, that's that's my little cover on. Um, Basically covers it, mate. Yeah, um, some shirts. Um, if, if there's any more questions, um, just for interest, Spectilius 5, and a pair of olives, both. Hang on, I'll see if I can get this. Uh, don't think you're going to get any shirts from K Brothers. No, nah, no, nah, K Brothers is dead and gone. So I'm just wearing this until I get me a new um, Friday night live um, reptile chat shirts going. So, and then when I get some of them going. We might get a merch shop going, I don't know, we'll see. Um, what's that one with Joey, Joey Hester? It's, it's, sorry Joey, I, I'm trying to read this man, I'm having a hard time with me eyes. Oh, here we go. That's why we asked, asked me Um, Oh, carpets will attack each other. Yeah, carpets will. Hell yeah. Olives, like I said, with the olives, I've never experienced it during breeding season. Um, during breeding season, it's always been the female. The, the males, I keep my males lean uh, and keen. You know, they, they know why they're, they're in there. 
Um, they're not in there to feed. They're in there to. <laughs> so, um, I had a I had a carpet, a carpet um albino, mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I I put a put a female uh, another male in there to stir him up. Yeah. And he turned around and bit himself thirty something times before I walked out of the room. <laughs> and, I, and I walked back in the room and he's still biting himself. Ah. Oh. Well, there you go, guys. I hope um, I do wait for male breeders. Uh, I do wait for male breeders. You, you really don't want them over that five, six kilo mark. I've found, I've found, you know, pushing up around that eight kilos too heavy, um, even seven kilos too heavy. Uh, I like my males around that five kilo mark. Uh, it doesn't really matter of age. Once they hit that five kilo, um, maybe six kilo, I like to maintain them. Um, but yeah. Yeah, males are, I don't, and the younger males, uh, even lighter again. So, you know, if I've got a younger male that's three kilos, um, I'll throw him in with, with a small four and a half kilo uh, first time female and, um, and let him go nuts. So, if there's, if I don't get, if there's more questions, shoot them through. If we get to them, we get to them. It's, it's 9.15. Um, so yeah, we've nearly been on for two hours, man. Um, so if we get to them, we get to them. If we don't, again, I'll cover it. Um, we still got post of the what have we got? Um, post of the week. We still got to cover post of the week. Now, post of the week uh, this week. I want to give that one to a uh, Dave Ludlow. So Dave Ludlow, he um, he posted up about uh, Clubrids in Australian reptiles and that thing um, I think that was back Saturday don't quote me on it and again I haven't got that written down um, but uh, that post went off so Australian reptiles that one, that one was in uh, now as for pick of the week and I am so dirty that I cannot show you guys um, these photos these photos are amazing uh, do us a favour pick of the week goes to Fuzzy Fox yeah, head over to Fuzzy Fox and give them a like. They've um, they put some photos up. The ones I'm talking about are again last Saturday. Um, last Saturday they, they had some amazing tongue shots of um, of of a heap of different animals. Um, so it wasn't just one one good shot. There was yeah there was about. I don't know six seven eight really good tongue shots. Um, oh guys. Um, it's uh, a lot of weight for a male and female. A lot of weight. Uh, I wouldn't use male anything under three and a half kilos. Uh, female, I really wouldn't go any lighter than about three point eight kilos. Uh, four kilos, yeah, four kilos, three point eight to four kilos. Anything under than that, uh, I believe, yeah, risk of um, egg bounding is is yeah too high. Um, so to me, if, if she's in that 3.8, 4 kilos, don't, um, don't rush it. Wait till next year. Get that, get the extra weight on her. So um, the risk is the big eggs? Yeah. 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 Uh, but even a small girl, well, you'll see when I talk about, uh, when you talk about Den and I removing eggs from, uh, from a girl, that was a girl that went too small. I think by memory she was about 3.6. Now I know other people have bred them smaller, mm. um, but but this girl she was about 3.6 kilos by memory, and the last four eggs she got, I think by memory she got eight eggs out. The last four eggs got stuck at the vent. She was exhausted. The eggs were big, and um, and it was just uh, it was too much for her. And then the next year, I had a hard time breeding her. Uh, by memory, I don't, I don't think she went. Um, I think I had to wait like two years. It wasn't until the third year that I had her back in sequence and going again. So to me, yeah, if they're that little bit under, don't, don't rush it. Leave it till next year and you'll end up with more because, yeah, the year's worth of trying to get that female ready again if she does get egg bound can really mess you up um is there any risk of males being bred too early no now i don't i don't know what 
what weight a male becomes fertile. Um, I, I don't know that one. I, no doubt I would have read it somewhere many years ago and forgotten it. Uh, but like I said, a uh, male I've never used under three, a male under three and a half kilos of weight. Um, again, the females that I use him with too are a minimum four and a half kilos, um, up five, six sort of, sort of kilos. So, um, yeah, you don't want a really little male that can just get swallowed up too easy. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. Just have a little bit of, a little bit of something there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>